a lunar science, a planetary science community as well. So, um, okay, thanks very much, everybody. Okay, so we have one more overview talk before we go to the parallel session. So Sarah Valencia is going to talk to us about the geochemistry parallel session. Hello, so the purpose of my talk today, give a brief introduction of lunar geochemistry uh, from what we know both at the small scale with the samples and the large scale uh, from remote sensing. And then I'm gonna give one example on how we use lunar geochemistry to uh, try and answer some of the remaining questions we have about volcanism on the moon, which is the formation of lunar granite. Uh, compared to many other sciences, geo uh, lunar geochemistry is in its infancy. Uh, we haven't been able to study the, we've only been able to study the chemistry of the moon since the Apollo program visited in the 1960s and 70s. Uh, and ever since then, there has been a, a fury of scientists trying to understand the, the composition of the, both the mantle, co uh, mantle, crust, and core of the moon, because after all, to understand a planet, it is, it is essential to determine its chemistry. Uh, since the initial Apollo days, there have been many uh, remote sensing missions that have uh, orbited the moon, as well as advances in sample techniques, which allow us uh, to improve what we know about the, the chemistry of the moon. Uh, and I think it's important as a community that we remember that we need both samples and remote sensing techniques in order to fully understand the chemistry of the moon. These two techniques sample uh, different things. Uh, remote sensing looks only at the uppermost surface of the moon, and uh, looking at the samples, we are often looking at only uh, tiny particles within a bulk rock. So we're kind of looking at two different scales, and we really need to remember that both are needed to have a full understanding of the chemistry of the moon. So let's start by looking at uh, some lunar samples. Um, one way, since uh, Apollo brought back 382 kilograms of uh, material, and we can look at this material uh, by looking at its major elements to start to understand the chemistry. Um, on the x-axis here, we're looking at iron, and uh, on the y-axis, we're looking at alumina concentrations. So what we see is we have a, quite a wide range of compositions of lunar samples. Uh, from those that are um, high aluminum and low iron, which are things like um, feldspathic breccias and things, uh, samples that are rich in a anorthosite uh, that represent the flotation crust from the lunar magma ocean, all the way down to uh, mare basalts, which are iron rich and low in alumina, and uh, these represent uh, the basalts that, that fill about 16% of the lunar surface. So let's go ahead and look at incompatible elements as well. Uh, when we start to look at a plot of iron versus thorium, we see that we don't just have a, a simple two end member mixing system at, that the uh, previous plot might suggest. Um, what we're actually looking at is several distinct groups of rocks, that, uh, rock types on the surface of the moon, from things that are low in thorium um, and other incompatibles such as troctolites, to things that are more moderate um, with the, the norites and mari basalts, to, uh, to samples that are very high in incompatible elements, uh, such as the granitic samples, which we'll talk about more later today. One of the interesting discoveries from the Apollo mission samples was that we have a wide range of compositions for lunar basalts. Uh, these are broken up into high titanium basalt, which uh, has uh, from six, uh, above six weight percent uh, TiO2. Then we have low titanium basalts, which are from about one weight percent to six weight percent TiO2. And then the very low titaniums, which are zero to one weight percent uh, TiO2. And we appear to have a, uh, a gap in titanium concentrations between the low titanium and the high titanium basalts. So let's switch gears a little bit, talk about what we know from remote sensing. This is a global map uh, of thorium. 
And we got our first peaks at uh, global geochemistry from the Apollo 15 and 16 gamma ray spectrometers. And they started to note that in um, the pro Procellarum area and uh, Western Imbrium, there were some uh, chemical anomalies. And later missions such as Clementine and Lunar Prospector uh, confirmed what, we see, what they were seeing. Um, and it's quite obvious when we start to look at this global map of thorium, we have distinct terrains on the moon. Uh, there's the Feldspathic Highlands terrain, where we have very low iron or very low thorium and other incompatibles. The South Pole Aiken terrain, uh, where there is slight enrichment, and then the Procellarum creep terrain, where we see uh, quite an enrichment in incompatible elements, including thorium. Looking, again, uh, looking now at a global map of iron, we see a, uh, a similar pattern, um, a low iron in the Feldspathic Highland terrains and higher in both uh, the South Pole Aiken terrain and highest in the Procellarum creep terrain. And the image on the right is a uh, map of the near side of the moon where all of the Apollo sample, uh, uh, the Apollo missions landed. And what we see is that these missions were all uh, firmly within the Procellarum creep terrain or very near its boundary, indicating that the samples all come from this anomalous region on the moon. Uh, here we're looking uh, at t uh, TiO2, which shows um, that, again, the, the Feldspathic Highlands terrain is very low. Um, in TiO2, and the Procellarum creep terrain has these elevated regions, which is where most of our Mare basalts are. We can also uh, use uh, remote sensing to look at the mineralogy. These are resu results from Diviner, uh, looking at the eight, eight micrometer Christ uh, Christiansen feature, um, where a, a shorter wavelength Christiansen feature will is more indicative of feldspathic materials. Um, and the redder regions are more uh, in indicative of ma uh, mafic minerals. So we're seeing uh, agreement with the, the chemical data where we have these more mafic regions and more feldspathic regions on the moon. So that's it. We have, we're done, right? We've got our sample data. We've got our remote sensing data. Surely we understand the chemistry of the moon. Well, not so fast. First, we need to keep in mind the Apollo samples are only representative from the anomalous region from which they were collected. Uh, and this plot on the right, this upper plot here, is titanium uh, concentrations in the mare basalt samples. And uh, as we saw in the previous uh, plot, we have uh, low titanium basalts and high titanium basalts, and an apparent gap between the two. But when we look at the remote sensing, which is the plot on the bottom, um, we have a spike at the low titanium basalt concentrations and then a, a gradual decrease in amount uh, in uh, in number of uh, regions that have that uh, titanium concentrations up to the high titanium regions. Uh, and we do not see that gap in titanium contents uh, between the low and the high titanium like we do in, in the samples. Um, so again, we're, we're looking at two different things, but we need both of them to really understand the uh, chemistry of the moon. It's also important to uh, remember we do have a lunar meteorite collection, which in theory samples the entire moon, uh, but because it's very difficult to tie uh, lunar meteorites to specific features on the lunar surface, um, it's, it's hard. Um, it, you begin, begin to compare apples and oranges, and it's hard to extrapolate too much further uh, from the meteorites. Uh, we're also limited in what elements we can measure remotely. Um, we do get some great elements from the spacecraft, but it cannot do everything, um, what, which we can measure virtually every element in the meteorite, or in the sample collection. Uh, and we also, we don't really focus much on what's happening between the micrometer and the kilometer scales. Um, and what actually goes on between the two may not be answered until we have a sustainable lunar architecture where we're, uh, we're sending many missions to the lunar surface. So let's take a uh, brief foray into lunar granite. So we want to understand, why we want to use lunar geochemistry to um, understand how granite is forming in the lunar environment. So we'll look at both 
but we'll look at what both remote sensing and the samples are telling. Lunar granite is a very uh, rare lithology from the sample collection. It's also been re observed remotely. Uh, we find it at Apollo 12, 14, and 15, and there's only about 20 uh, known lunar granite fragments. And these are fragments, we call them granite because they're um, uh, rich in both silica and potassium feldspar. And despite decades of study, their formation in, uh, in the lunar environment is poorly understood. There are three prevailing theories. The extended fractionalization, uh, fractional crystallization of a creepy magma, silicate liquid immiscibility, and partial melting during basaltic underplating. Uh, we can rule out extended fractional crystallization of a creepy magma uh, due to the lack of intermediate samples in the, uh, the Apollo and Luna and meteorite collections. We don't see anything like andesite or dacite in the samples, uh, so we're going to rule that out for now. So we'll take a look at silicate liquid immiscibility, which has been uh, observed in the samples, such as in this from Roter and Weebland. You can see little black blebs in a light glass, uh, and these are actually two immiscible melts that formed. So this is observed on the micrometer scale, but it, there's um, uh, some doubt on whether this uh, silicate liquid immiscibility could have uh, been a pr productive enough formation mechanism to form the large granite bodies that are uh, silicic bodies that are observed on the surface of the moon. We'll also take a look at uh, basaltic underplating, which, uh, in contrast, is a proposed formation mechanism for those large granitic bodies on the surface of the moon, but hasn't been directly observed in lunar samples. So here's a couple examples of uh, these silicic bodies on the surface of the moon. On the left, we have Mons Hanstein, and on the right, we have Gruthais and Gamma. These are lunar hotspots that are topographic highs formed from um, some viscous materials. We'll look more closely at one of these uh, features. This is the uh, this is Compton Belkovich, the Compton Belkovich volcanic uh, volcanic center, and uh, I, here it is on the left here. Oh, it's all the way on the left there, um, and so. Compton Belkovich um, is uh, a lunar hotspot. Uh, yeah, it, it was a hotspot, and it was observed to have low titanium and low iron, and it also has a, a thorium enrichment in the area. You can see in the middle plot there, it is, there's a, a bullseye right over the Compton Belkovich um, region. And up to nine parts per million thorium, but a deconvolution of the thorium indicates that um, thorium in the region is actually probably uh, closer to 55 parts per million, which puts it right in the range of what we would expect for something like a lunar granite. On the, on the, the rightmost image there, looking at, um, again, the Christiansen feature, we see that it has a shorter wavelength, uh, eight micrometer feature, indicating, again, more silicic material. So let's take a look at what a granite might actually look like in a sample. For this, we're going to use Apollo 12 sample 12013. It's quite a unique rock. Um, here you uh, can see it plotted uh, against um, all of the 2 to 4 millimeter lithic fragments from the Apollo 12 regolith, which should, in theory, represent the site as a whole. And there is 12013 sitting at the top. It's one of the four non-basaltic rocks from Apollo 12. Uh, it was immediately noted when it was brought back to Earth that it was interesting because it has high levels of incompatible elements. Um, you may remember creep was first discovered at Apollo 12, so there was a flurry of excitement over these uh, samples with these high incompatible elements. Uh, we know 12013 to be exotic to the Apollo 12 site. There, um, it's not entirely clear where it comes from, but it didn't come from Apollo 12. And it's been broadly des uh, described as a two-component breccia. We have a gray breccia and a black breccia, or a dark and a light breccia, as you can see in the image. Um, you know, we have the dark and light areas. So what my work aimed to do was to take a, another look at, at 12013, which hadn't been really examined too much since the 1970s. So we requested fresh samples 
we took 25 fragments of 12013 and we aimed to explore the entire the entire diversity of compositions contained within the rock and my work shows that there are actually three components in 12013 and that it is inappropriate to call it a two component system uh, so here you're looking at a plot of lanthanum on the x-axis, which is used to represent the rare earth elements, and barium on the y-axis, which is used to represent elements like barium, potassium, thorium, uranium, um, which are all elements that like to stick together. Uh, so all of the colored, uh, colored symbols are fragments from 12013. All of the black uh, circles are still those uh, lithic fragments from the regolith. So most uh, lunar samples plot right along that creep line, and 12013 does not behave. It likes to, to scatter and plot off the creep line, which makes it super interesting. So we have these three components. The first is a granitic component, which is high in barium, low in lanthanum, or the rare earth elements. Second component is a rare earth element rich component, which is high in lanthanum and low in barium. And then we have a more mafic component, which is low in both barium and lanthanum. And then we also have uh, several fragments that were predominantly mixtures of um, either the mafic and the granite component or the rare earth element rich and the mafic component. So the rest of the talk, I'm just gonna talk about the granitic and the rare earth element rich components. Okay, so we have the granitic component, which is uh, light in hand sample dominated by potassium feldspar and acicular silica with uh, a host of trace minerals and it has, uh, it has much more potassium feldspar than uh, plagioclase feldspar with an interesting crystallization trend. Pyroxene has an average Mg number of 37 which will become important. The second component is the rare earth element rich component. It's dark in hand sample dominated by these angular to sub-rounded class that are predominantly plagioclase and pyroxene. Um, in this x-ray uh, composite map, you can see them in the red for uh, plagioclase, green for pyroxene. When we switch to a, another x-ray composite map, uh, many fragments in the, uh, in the matrix uh, seem to pop out that, are, uh, that represent minerals such as uh, zircon bearing, or zirconium bearing minerals and phosphates. And this is where the uh, rare earth elements are going to hide. Um, and so this is how it got its rare earth element nature. And based on the textures and zoning that we see in the sample, we interpret this to be an impact melt breccia. Uh, Plagioclase con concentrations have a high range, and again, important, as an av average Mg number in the pyric scene of 63. The rare earth element uh, plots indicate that these two uh, components might have a relationship where the rare, rare earth element rich component decreases in the air is uh, doesn't uh, where the granitic component is enriched in the heavy rare earth elements, uh, the rare earth element rich component is depleted in the heavy rare earths. So they are complementary and indicates a relationship. So how could lunar granite have formed? Could this have been from silicate liquid immiscibility? If it was, this is my, how it might have looked. A creep rich magma would intrude into the mega regolith or the crust. Fractional crystallization of the melt would begin. Due to density differences, some of these minerals would sink to the bottom of the magma chamber. As the melt uh, became, uh, as, as the melt progressed, it would become, uh, eventually become immiscible, splitting, splitting into a K frac and a reap frac, where we have the potassium and, associate, and barium and associated elements in the granitic fraction, and the iron are rare earth elements and phosphorus in the other. So is this how 12013 formed? According to Chuck Mayer, uh, there appears to be considerable confusion. Many authors interpreted 12013 to have formed by silicate liquid immiscibility, and certainly the complementary rare earth element pattern supports this. Again, and we also see this splitting of the K frac and reap frac, so that does help our argument. But we find that there's not enough uh, evidence to support SLI. Um, the pyroxene compositions are not in equilibrium. The magnesium numbers are um, quite far apart. In addition, uh, the experiments say that thorium goes into the reap frac, and what we're seeing is high concentrations of thorium in the granite. So again, we do not think that silicate liquid emissibility is a plausible formation mechanism for at least some lunar granite. <clears throat> 
So could it be basaltic underplating? In this situation, we would have um, a hot magma, a basaltic magma, heating a fertile crust, and, and the, that partial melt would then be our rare earth element, fra uh, a rare earth element component, and the fractional crystallization could lead to our granitic component. Uh, so with that, I lead you, uh, leave you with this. We might have uh, evidence for large uh, bi bimodal volcanism on the moon, um, but we need to really find out what's happening between the micrometer and kilometer scales. Uh, uh, between, the uh, between the samples we have and the remote sensing data we have. And to do this, we're really going to need a stable architecture of landed lunar missions. Thank you. So uh, I just have a quick question. Um, the all right, if the sample is derived from these very young volcanic terrains, that would suggest the rock itself is fairly young. But I was just looking on the web during your talk, and it's, it sounds like the rock actually may be around 4 billion years old. Yes. So, so are those two consistent? Uh, I, what were you referring to that was very young? Um, well, aren't some of the volcanic regions you're sort of inferring it might be from? Aren't those? Oh, I'm not saying that, I'm not saying that 1213 is specifically from those dated volcanic regions. Okay. Um, uh, we don't know the source of 12013, but yes, it, 